Oh. Hey, how are you doing? Welcome to my apartment. Uh, this is where I live, and that's my security camera. So I'm talking with the onboard audio, this kind of device right here. Here's what it sounds like on the camera. Pretty, Pretty bad. bad, and the pictures also, I mean, there's probably a lot of artifacts. All right, here's the camera. It's a Reolink RLC 520, and it's pretty nice. I mean, the picture, as you saw, and good enough for a security camera. It also has some really cool features like a built-in motion detection. So if it sees something, it'll record a clip, you know, 30 second long clip of whoever it was in the frame. But that's the thing. It's not always whoever it was, it's whatever motion was detected. And sometimes it will detect a change in the lighting from outside that kind of gets reflected through the apartment. Uh, or it just won't record anything at all, which is really bad. So I'm wondering, what if there's a way to smartify it? You know, only trigger when people come into frame. <laughs> That's what we are going to attempt to do today. And I'm just gonna say this, there's a reason that I kind of gravitate towards hardware stuff and more low level things because machine learning and, and computer vision, it's just, uh, I'm not gonna lie. This project was a bit of a nightmare to pull off and it took a long time to come out, so I'm really sorry about that. But fear not, I'm gonna kinda walk you through my whole process to hopefully save you guys some headache if you try and replicate this yourselves. For this magic trick, I'm gonna be doing perhaps a bit of a strange hardware setup, uh, or at least it's a bit of a departure from what I usually do. I'm gonna virtualize the hell out of it. That's right, baby, no bare metal, well, except for this server, which is the physical hardware where everything's going to be running. So let's go over the just bare metal hardware that we're using. Uh, this is a bit of an old PC. This was actually my first gaming PC, if you can consider it that. I mean, oh boy. Yeah, I know it doesn't look like much and that's because it's not. I didn't really have a lot of money going through college, but I did have a propensity to do dumpster diving. So this was actually a dumpster PC find. And at that time, it was the most powerful computer that I had ever seen with my own eyes. So really fantastic stuff. It's got an i7-4770, and, and without the K, that's important. We'll get to that. Uh, it has a GT 1030 graphics card. It's got two boot drives. These are set up in RAID 1, so I have you know redundancy should one drive fail. Uh, it's got 16 gigs of memory, and for whatever reason, also a CD-ROM drive. It's also got this interesting red card here, and I kind of spoiled this a little bit on the channel. So let's pull it out and actually talk about it. Before we talk about this, first things first. This server will be running Proxmox, which is a hypervisor for the VMs that we'll have to create, or actually just VM. This is just how I thought about doing this. So we're gonna make one VM, one fairly large VM, and we're gonna use the two drives here, these two, I won't show it again, the two drives, RAID 1. We've talked about RAID before, so eh. And this is more exciting. So here's the layout so far, right? Hardware, Proxmox hypervisor, VM. And this VM, we're gonna give it two cores, so four threads, and we're gonna give it also eight gigabytes of memory. Should be pretty good, enough to handle some big things that you might wanna throw at it. The important thing here is the CPU is a 4770, no K. I don't know why Intel does this, but if it's a CPU with a K, so it's overclockable, then it doesn't support IOMMU or VTD, which are interesting acronyms, and I'm not gonna leave you hanging. Well, let's talk about what that is. If you have some PCI Express device or some USB device, and you want to give it, assign it to a VM, that is called PCI Express pass-through. So on Intel CPUs, that instruction set is called VTD. On AMD, it's called IOMMU. And what that instruction set does is it allows that CPU to take, okay, I have this IO device, I have some extra device, and I can es essentially assign it to a virtual machine that's not running on bare metal. It's pretty cool, and it's absolutely critical for this. So this, now, okay, I've let you hang in long enough. Let's talk about this. So for many reasons, CPU power is not going to be enough on its own for the type of workload that we're gonna be running. This red card is a simple PCI Express to mini PCIe adapter, and then there's another 
take a look at that. There's another little green card that is mini PCI to M.2. And then the little thing on it, that is the important part. Take a look at that. Maybe I'll get you a better view. This is a Google Coral TPU. What's a TPU? A tensor processing unit. What's a tensor? Uh, see, it keeps going down the rabbit hole. Simply put, tensors are just buckets of numbers of a specific shape and a certain rank, uh, which means that the structure of the object is well-defined. So this is a very well-defined object of numbers and tensors are used in machine learning with TensorFlow to represent input data and output data and everything in between uh, in machine learning models. In computer terms, a giant matrix of numbers, which is what this is, is a very tricky thing to run calculations on because typically you'd have to go one by one and perform the same calculation on every number in the set. TPUs like this one here parallelize that process, meaning that tons of simultaneous processes can happen at once, and they're all the same process. The job of this Google Coral TPU is neural network inferencing. So what inferencing is, is you take a trained neural network model. So we have a model about, you know, this is what a person looks like. And the machine, uh, the machine builds a model based on images that we feed it, train it, you get, the, you get the picture. This will take that model and then use it to infer results on new sets that we pass in. So those new sets are the video feed. They're about seven frames per second of just, you can think of it, seven still images per second and this thing needs to infer if there are people in that, in each image, you know, seven times a second. So it's a big job and you can kind of see why a CPU is not really the best hardware for the job. So we've got the hardware, we've got Proxmox, we've got a pretty large VM, and we have a Google Coral TPU passed through to that VM. Let's do the next step, Home Assistant. Like how I have my script right there? <laughs> it's so much easier to film this way. Home Assistant is a lot of things, but it's basically just a self-hosted platform for interacting with IoT devices and getting reports about any of those findings. It's very, very cool and very powerful. And like all open source community-driven projects, there's a ton of stuff that's already pre-built for you to kind of just use, you know, configure yourself and then just use and it just works. And one of those things is a little project called Frigate. And Frigate is a complete and local NVR designed for Home Assistant with AI object detection. Uses OpenCV and TensorFlow to perform real-time object detection locally for IP cameras. Perfect. A couple of interesting words there. OpenCV, TensorFlow, maybe you've heard of some of these? OpenCV is a very popular and open source computer vision framework. So basically, it's probably the foundation for a lot of those what is in this image projects. And we're gonna use it to see if a person walks into the frame of my camera. Very simple, or so you would hope. It wasn't actually that simple. Ugh. And TensorFlow is another really widely known open source framework for building and training models and inferencing. It's, you've likely heard of that one before or I, I, I hope. <laughs> so in my installation of Home Assistant, I added the Frigate add-on, it's very simple, and then I just modified the configuration of free, for Frigate. And don't worry, links to that and, and everything else that I'm talking about here are gonna be provided in the description. I'm also gonna have a link to a repository on GitHub where I have my specific configuration file if you choose to use the same real link camera. Something I really had to play around a lot with was how to actually connect to the camera to Home Assistant, and it was kind of tricky. Frigate uses FFmpeg to handle video streams, and for my camera specifically, it's sending FLV, that kind of file type of video, and it's sending it over HTTP to the server. And then when the server receives that video stream, it's processed in three separate steps or three step separate processes. So the first one is actually the detection process. So it's looking at each frame and running that inferencing like we talked about to see if there's a person in that frame. The next step is for recording. So it's gonna record footage for seven days, uses a ton of storage space, but I have space to give, so it's no big deal. And then the last process is actually taking that FLV video stream that's received by the server and then rebroadcasting it as RTMP, which is a very widely used uh, broadcasting protocol. 
If you're familiar with Twitch streaming, then the RTMP protocol is actually the one that's used by OBS to send the video stream up to the Twitch servers and then for them to do whatever they want with it. But RTMP is how that, that stream goes from the streamer's computer to Twitch. It's really cool. The frigate configuration file also has a lot of other really important information, uh, such as you know when I'm detecting what objects do I care about. I just have uh, you know person in there, but you can also do like cats, a specific object, dogs, plants. It's it's crazy. There's a bunch of flags for the FFmpeg process, so you know H.264 video encoding, decoding, that sort of thing. This is probably not the place to go into all of that stuff. <laughs> And there's also a field called detectors, and this is where I specifically say that, yes, I have a Coral TPU, and you can find it uh, through PCIe. It's, it's connected through PCI Express. The final step is MQTT, which is a publisher subscriber model uh, message publishing service. That's a lot of words. Basically, the way that MQTT works is there's a topic. So in our case, maybe the topic is called, it's frigate slash events. That's the topic. When Frigate detects a person in the camera, it will publish a message to that topic, and then that topic can have subscribers. So I, my phone, could subscribe to that topic, and if that happens, that, that publish happens, then MQTT sends a message to the subscribers of that topic. So it's very, like, this is, this is how a lot of, you know, text communication works. It's MQTT. Mosquito is an open source MQTT broker, and it, like Frigate, is also an add-on for Home Assistant. You can, you can kind of see, start to see how powerful Home Assistant is, right? And that's all set up in the configuration file as well. So take a look. So all told, this project was a little bit of a nightmare to pull off. And to be honest, a lot of that was just me not getting a lot of time to work on it over the past few months. I'm just happy that I'm finally here giving you some video to prove that I'm still alive and I'm still working on these projects. And not only that, I, I even have like new toys like uh, 3D printer, huh? There are a couple of notes that I wanna add about the project before I just close off the video. Uh, first is about this thing right here, which is a, it's actually another TPU and it's just a USB version. So I had no problem taking the PCI device, the PCI Express uh, M.2 accelerator. I had no problem taking that and passing it through to the VM but no matter what I tried, Frigate would just not recognize it. Like no matter what I tried, I couldn't get it to show up at all. So I, I had to just scrap that idea. My intuition's telling me that it's probably has something to do with the two adapters. I'm using the PCI Express adapter to mini PCI and then to the tensor uh, processing unit. And I just think that somewhere along the way, the signal is getting corrupted who, who knows this is pretty cool it's the same thing it's just through usb and it, it routes with usb 3 to the motherboard and i'm gonna kind of stick it in the case through a pci express slot and then just plug this on the outside so it's gonna look kind of bad but it'll work <laughs> the coral tpu really is the hero of this project it's cut my cpu utilization down like by 50 percent and it does inferencing 10 times faster than if I had just used the system as is. It's, un it's incredible. The other thing is the MQTT broker. I slightly misspoke when I talked about it before. It is necessary for some of the internal plumbing of Frigate, but it's not how I'm receiving notifications on my phone. I actually have the Home Assistant app on my phone. You can see the, the camera feed right there. Uh, but this is really nice because no externally configured MQTT is required. Home Assistant goes from the box here and will securely connect to my phone and I can just receive notifications and look at the camera feed that way. This was accomplished by simply creating an automation from a blueprint that's provided by Jason Hunter. Again, his GitHub will be in the description. It was really helpful for getting this all set up. And that is also the broader message of this whole project. The community is always really, really helpful with these open source projects. All told, this was a truly incredible project. I think it's safe to say that I probably won't be touching much machine learning or computer vision in the future. It's, you know, call it personal preference, but I am glad that I got this off the ground. So thanks for your patience in waiting for this video to come out, and I hope to see you on the next one, where we're gonna be diving into PFSense again, so stay tuned. Later.